Hey guys, this is Roman Zelenka and welcome to my podcast where I explore the wisdom of those around us. Today I have connected uh, with a business guru, <laughs> Gustavo Rassetti from Chicago. Gustavo was uh, very active for more than 20 years in many executive positions in the US and Argentina. Now he is CEO at Fearless Culture Consulting Company. He helps leaders to build more human, agile, and innovative uh, organizations. Gustavo, welcome to the show. Thank you, Roman, and, and welcome. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Very excited and see what are the questions that you have ready for us today. <laughs> Amazing. I told my wife that today I'm interviewing uh, George Clooney because you, you look exactly like him. <laughs> Anybody told you that you look uh, the same? <laughs> like well, I heard that a couple of times before <laughs> in airports and weird places, but uh, I'm used to it. <laughs> I don't think I'm looked like him, but uh, I mean, for whatever reason, people see the similarities and that's okay. <laughs> Amazing. It's always a good conversation starter. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. So Gustavo, uh, today we, we want to discuss uh, how to future-proof uh, company culture. So in one sentence, because you are an expert for transforming a uh, company's culture uh, through training, advice, and co-creation, can you tell us what does it mean? Yeah. So great question. So first of all, I would say I'm no, I'm not an expert. No, I think that uh, what I'm saying, I think that they were, when we become an expert, we stop learning <clears throat> and we get stuck into, uh, I have all the answers. I think I'm trying to be a facilitator. I'm curious about learning how a uh, help companies build and teams build better cultures. And as I mentioned, it's a, it's a never ending kind of game. When it comes to future proof, I, I don't think it's a silver bullet. There's no one single approach that you say, ah, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to be ready. But the most important thing that we can uh, uh, learn if you're leading a team or an organization is what are the things that we need to let go? Because basically the burdens, the things, the way we used to do things, that's the thing that gets most companies stuck. It's not that you need to be changing everything all the time, but there are things that at some point you need to say, you know what, this no longer serves us. Are we really willing to kill it? So we make room for new things. That's about becoming open to the future when you let, let go of the past. Huh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. So, and, and do, do you think, or how, how do you think it's, uh, uh, it's uh, important to have a good company culture? Because you mentioned in one of your interviews or, or webinars, that um, in 2020, it's uh, uh, starting a decade of uh, culture first organizations. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. That comes from a study that Glassdoor did in terms of, I mean, they, they, they review the best places to work. And that's basically what they are seeing is people are more willing to choose the right culture over the right paycheck. I mean, people want, and don't, and some people, sometimes people get confused, you know, when we say that, for example, people are willing to sacrifice income to work at the right environment. So they use it, oh, I'm going to pay less. Well, that's not the point. The point is you should pay the more you can, the best salaries you can, but uh, apples to apples, if you're paying or offering similar positions, similar job conditions, culture is going to make the difference. Mm -hmm. We know that a uh, Year after year, all the Gallup survey shows that people are not engaged in war, at work. We know that there's a prediction that after the COVID, when things go back to the new normal, at least 20 to 30% of people are, are really considering leaving their jobs because they are done with their companies and because their managers didn't treat them uh, in the right way. They are overburdened. They are uh, exhausted because of working many hours and bosses controlling them through Zoom all the time. Well, that's the power of culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just drink some water so we can we can continue. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree. And, and just just imagine that, that now people they start uh, used to work uh, from home, so they have their own computer, the old stuff, and it's very easy to change your employer. And uh, so people will look definitely for um, enlightened leaders and companies with a good company culture uh, where they can earn some money and definitely where they feel 
uh, some appreciation and they feel it as a, as a fit. What, what do you think about it? No, absolutely. I was thinking uh, the other day I was running a, a couple of uh, projects and, and workshops with a large European, but actually global, you know, um, let's say a company with more than 200,000 employees. And we were using, I mean, I use, uh, normally use Zoom, but they were using Teams. And one of the things that caught my attention is that most people weren't using the camera, which is, if you're having an audiovisual tool, then what's the point? No, let's have a call. But basically, I start asking the team a leader, what's going on with that people don't use the camera? Because it feels like, okay, if I'm not here, then I can be checking emails or watching TV or doing whatever. And they can say, you know what? Well, there's a lot of people that are having issues with their broadband, no? so they cannot use videos. So that's, I say, okay, that makes sense. But then I was thinking companies are having people working from home. Getting from home is expensive because you're, you're using more uh, utilities, more stuff from your home. But then your company is saving money in rent, in services, utilities, providing maybe food or coffee, whatever, lots of, and they're not even willing to pay people to get a better broadband. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I know that many companies have done. It might feel silly, but in the end, it's like, okay, it's a win-win. If people have to work from home with all the limitations that are implied, how are you willing to support them? Not just emotionally, but also functionally, you know, give them a better computer, a pay for the softwares, like give them a better broadband access so they can really work like in the 21st century, you know, like a, 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 the example of the video might be silly, but then the same happens when sharing files and using certain tools that people either don't have the right bandwidth to use them or the right space in their houses to work from home or even worse, there are many companies that their IT manager says, ah, you cannot use Mural, you cannot use this. So they say no to a lot of tools that are collaborative. So how can you work in the remote 21st century with tools that are one century old? <laughs> yeah, or maybe sometimes uh, I think it's an excuse that um, sometimes also people, they don't want to be seen on, on cameras, uh, but this is... Uh, I think um, it hurts um, company culture and, and engagement of, of people. Uh, and Gustavo, as, as an expert, because I, I will call you an expert. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I get it. I get it. Yeah, I'm going to fight it. <laughs> uh, do you have uh, some, some tools or exercise that uh, uh, company owners here in Europe or uh, around the world can apply uh, when they lead? Uh, their teams uh, remotely and how they can um, nurture uh, their company culture? Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, I think that the most important thing that you mentioned is a, a being mindful which tools you use when, no? Mm -hmm. So the same way we're saying, if you use Zoom or Teams and you're using the camera, a research shows that a productivity of a meeting increases by 20, 30%. Because that's the point of body language, sharing stuff. There are tools like Mural or Miro that are really, really great for a, a sharing because you can basically replicate having a brainstorming or a collaboration session with post-its, but in a canvas and everything's editable. People can join from anywhere. Not only they can work at the same time, but then people can also uh, join and continue working on their own pace and follow up, which is a great stuff. You know, because in, in regular meetings, in-person meetings, People get together, then everyone goes back to their craziness and the collective uh, uh, practice get lost. Uh, one thing that's important, as I mentioned, uh, uh, critical for people working remotely, it's documentation. So the companies that have been working remotely since the get-go, they've been successful because they created a depository, could be Google Docs, you know, if you want to keep it simple, but where everything, all the information, all the decisions, everything gets captured in one place. So that reduces a lot of email and calls because instead of going to my team members, hey, what do we decide about this? Where's that a, a document about that project? Everything's a depository. So people go directly. They don't need to start interacting with other people like they usually do to find that material. Mm -hmm. Then there's the idea to a shorter meetings in the, in the virtual space Shorter works better because of, uh, but I mean, in any space, but you know, I always pray, um, encourage people to have shorter meetings. But for example, in the case of Microsoft, they did a research back in June last year and they realized that people were shifting their one hour meetings to 30 meetings and that's even more effective. 
and also having small, short touch points to see how people are doing or creating relationships that we usually cannot. You now, for example, creating like a water cooler a channel on Zoom and people can join at any time. And it's not about work. It's not about a project. It's just join and talk about whatever you want. You want to bend, you're tired. You, don't, you cannot stand your kids at home and your dog. You want to share with your kids or something great happened that you want to just share with someone. Let's do it. No? So those are things. Uh, another thing that's critical is limiting the time that people work, no? because that people are at the home, it's like the fantasy is like being at the office 24 seven. So I can reach out to them all the time. One thing I advise clients is don't send email or Slack messages or anything after working hours and before working hours and no communications during the weekends. And there's many things that you can do that, for example, like a, you can block your company server. So if your CEO can sleep at night or he likes to work during the weekends, that's on him or her, but the emails won't be sent until regular hours so people don't get distracted. No, And then if there's an emergency, well, that's the usual, the, the traditional phone, <laughs> call people <laughs> when there's an emergency. No, email is not for emergency. So there's so many, many things that we can do to better improve communication, which is critical for remote teams. Mm -hmm. And when you, because you mentioned at the beginning that um, many times you facilitate some workshops and maybe use some, some tools. Uh, I heard that you are an expert for culture design canvas and mm -hmm. how does it work? Because uh, some companies, uh, they know that company culture is important. Sometimes they talk about values. Uh, they have an idea, you know, how to make it better. But right now they, uh, of course, they struggled last year to, to, to convert to be remote. But now if they want to uh, nurture that company culture online, uh, can you give us some advice how to do that and, and what do you do in your workshops? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that I'm going to share, uh, as we initially talked about, this is the, the culture design canvas, which is a framework that we created. Uh, I mean, I created a couple of like four years ago and we've been using first with our clients, but now we make it a, a accessible so everyone. It's a common uh, the, the licensing so basically everyone can use the tool no you don't need to be a client of ours to use it but most importantly to your point what we realize is that usually people have a misconception of what culture is now we talk about culture like something very uh, fluffy big no and i want to make sure that we can provide a tool to make culture and the culture conversations more actionable so there are things that you can tackle that you can act upon so in that sense we always know that people talk about mission or vision or purpose which are different but some people you see that and they talk about values and that feels to be oh that's my culture right mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, one thing that's critical is what are the behaviors because in the end what you reward and punish as an organization basically bring those values to life. You know? So for example, in the case of a, a Southwest airline, they reward having a sense of humor and being empathetic. Those traits are critical, not only to get you a job in Southwest, which is a regional US airlines, but basically also to make sure you're going to perform well in a company that is very tribal, that they allow people to bring their sense of humor and even do jokes when, for example, they're doing an announcement, a safety announcement to all the passengers and, and, and the employees can do it in a funny way versus reading the formal document or the script that a lawyer wrote. Mm -hmm. you no, know? And in terms of punish, Slack punish a, a, a people who are a maybe stupid or, or, or not so good, a, a, what I mean, Uh, team players, no, even they're smart, no, they're not going to tolerate that behavior. So in, in a nutshell, this is what we call the core of any culture. Imagine this as the foundation. If you're going to build a building, you need to have the foundation in the right place so you can build and it doesn't collapse. So this is the long-term aspect of culture. Then on the right side, we have the emotional part of culture and then the functional side of culture. Emotion has to do with psychological safety. So how we encourage people to feel safe. So for example, there's a company called, Australian company called Atlassian that practice says a, a turn taking. So this is critical also in, in, in virtual teams. We know that psychological safety is the ability for us to feel safe, to speak up, to challenge conventions or status quo, 
to share my ideas, to be myself without feeling uh, uh, intimidated or there's going to be any kind of re retaliation. And, um, and by approaching turn thinking, you make sure that everyone in the room gets their turn to speak up. You know, basically this, the, the same uh, uh, airtime. And this is critical in remote team because if not, we have the louder voices are the ones who are capturing all the conversation. Research show us that 20% of people do 80% of the talk and that's not good. So by allowing everyone to have their turn and someone facilitating, you, you create that uh, psychological safety uh, space, but also uh, uh, the most senior people, the most louder voices should always go last. So they don't interrupt uh, introverts or women or minorities. No? Uh, within the emotional culture, we also have feedback and rituals that we can talk about that, which is rituals are critical to build sense of belonging. And then, I added this to the canvas because I think that are critical, no? So the way we meet, you know, how we manage our meetings, the way we make decisions as a team or as an organization and the norms and rules that guide our behavior, both written and unwritten, all those shape culture. So it's not a, some HR process, no, they're part of our culture, no? So uh, do we have a clear decision-making process or does anyone in the company think that we should make decisions in a different way and we're not aligned on that? No, that's something critical to uh, basically uncover. And I think that this has created a lot of uh, pain, especially during uh, the, the post-COVID crisis, I mean, the COVID crisis, uh, working uh, remotely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I'm interested to to talk about rituals because I think uh, this is very powerful in some companies. I know companies where, where they, if they win a job, uh, if they, they have a new project, they have a bell or something. Uh, do you know some example of a company where uh, you think they have some great ritual that, that we can uh, mm, uh, get inspiration from? Absolutely. I think that the first thing that people need to understand is rituals are not a uh, Friday beer time. No? So a happy hour is not a ritual unless it has a special meaning, but it's more of a something that rituals are uh, things that have a certain frequency and repetition. And through those, we kind of, uh, uh, we build meaning. Um, Unlike routines, they are deeper, they require much more a, a awareness and participation and energy to be successful. Mm -hmm. They're all about celebrating people, they're celebrating the culture, and of course, celebrating work. Maybe when you, you as you mentioned, or maybe we want a new client or we just a, a, a launch a new project and we want to celebrate it. No, that's part of a ritual part behavior. But then there's also, how can we welcome people, you no know, new employees to our company culture? You no. Know? Mm -hmm. So for example, Airbnb, they form like a human tunnel. So imagine two team members holding hands and then two more and two more. So they have uh, hundreds of people and the new employees have to go through that tunnel in order to feel welcome. So I think it has a real uh, emotion and storytelling, which are critical for rituals, that the moment you go through that, you're basically, your your uh, colleagues are welcoming you but then you come to the other side, no? Mm -hmm. And you're being, you're coming from the outside to the inside of culture. And I think that's a great metaphor. There are also rituals that work in a very a, unexpected way. So Zappos, the shoe retailer, they have a ritual that it's the a pay to quit bonus. So basically a, employees, new employees go through a three month a, 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 a program where they learn everything about the company culture, about the, how to work, everything. But then after they complete that, they're offered a check of $3,000. So imagine someone young, because maybe this is their first job at any company and say, you know what? If you leave because you don't like us, we're willing to pay you money. So that's, oh, wow, that's crazy. And uh, what's funny about it is only 3% of people accept the offer. So basically the majority decides to stay. And this proves how powerful the culture is that people say, you know what? I mean, I could grab a check and then I find a job in another retailer and that's okay. But this is reverse psychology. By saying no to money, people need to convince to them, themselves that they made the best decision ever. Mm -hmm. That means they start reprogramming, rewiring their brains to say, wow, Zappos is great, this culture is lovely, and then they become super excited about being part of that uh, organization. 
Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. And this is a good test how uh, their company culture, uh, how it's really powerful. And I also, uh, I watch uh, some, uh, some presentation uh, of yours. And um, when we talk about uh, the site uh, of the part norms and rules, I remember, and you can, you can expand on that, uh, one example from Netflix uh, when they uh, travel for, for business. Uh, what was that specific instruction they, they uh, have to use and how does it work? Absolutely. I think that it, we're going to first take a zoom out and then we go to the example, which is why Netflix did that. No, Netflix decided to revisit many of their rules uh, because they realized that when you control people, you don't get basically the way you treat your employees is how employees are going to treat you. So if you treat them like I don't trust you, if you treat them like, oh, if I'm not controlling you, you're not going to work. And then people say, you know what? I'm only going to work and when you see me. So basically you get the reversed no, the, uh, behavior. So Netflix realized that balancing a, a freedom with accountability is the way to go. So they started revisiting their policies. And one of those was the travel policy. Like every company or most companies, they have like a manual specifying depending on your tenure, your title, seniority, depending on the client, how many days you're gonna travel, if you're gonna take a flight that takes longer than six hours, well, they give you the options of you should do this, you should do that, whatever, no, very prescriptive. So they realize what if we let people make the smart decisions? Because sometimes you might need a short flight, no, talking about context, but you're tired or the decision or the project at stake is so big that I better have my team fly in, in first class and be you know, pampered so they get that, they bring that project home. So it's not always logic that finance or HR put together. So the interesting thing is they came together with do what's a, a best for Netflix. No? So basically take Netflix interest at consideration and that's it. And it's funny because when you share this, employees say, wow, this is great. I wish my company do that. When I share this, because I work with a lot of CEOs, they say, ah, no, if I do this, my people are going to start abusing the system. They're going to start spending money. They're going to go crazy. The truth is when Netflix implemented that policy, giving people complete freedom, their costs, their trouble and expenses actually went down. So, you know what I mean? That's it. Basically, when we trust people, people are going to do that. There's always going to be someone that's going to try to a benefit and play the system and that's okay but usually there's one two three people will talk to them but don't punish the majority of people that are good-hearted and want to do great work mm -hmm. i love what you are saying and i think because i remember my times about 10 years ago uh, when i was uh, leading uh, our family business um, it was different because I, when I was insecure that if I'm good enough, if I'm a good leader, um, should I trust people? Should I give them that freedom? And I was not so much open to that. And uh, so we had specific rules and, and it was really very tight. But um, what I want to say that after a couple of years, I work on myself and, um, and suddenly, um, um, and this is why I think that we should lead us as a leaders first then we can lead better our teams then we can lead better companies and maybe the whole world will be will be better because but we need to start from the inside uh, do you think the same or you have uh, opposite opinion about it no i think that i mean uh, there's no one single rule to rules if you know what i mean mm -hmm. for example i i think that sometimes when you're growing into a leader role of course you have to confront your own fears, your own maturity, and that sometimes reflect in how you treat people. No, you need to trust yourself to trust others, but also trust goes both ways. And I think that it's important who gives the first step, and usually leaders should be the ones versus expecting people. It's always important uh, when I share examples from a company, I say these are just for you to inspire and to rethink how you think our culture, but not to copy paste it. No, So some companies require a certain rules in place. Some companies are in a bad place. So uh, the, you need to consider the, the reality of each organization to see what's the best approach. 
And also Netflix didn't let go of all the policies in, in, in a one shot. They were basically changing one another and testing. And, and also sometimes you can start testing with some more uh, easy ones, you know. But for example, now when it comes to remote working, I always say people like focus on the outcome, not on the uh, time, no? So many people say, oh, I want to see that my employees are working. I don't care if my employees are working 24 hours. Are they doing great work? So focus, the outcome is the right one, is what I want. If people work one hour or 10, that's on them. Because some people are really fast. And if they can do the same project that, and job that others in half the time, well, are you going to punish them? Why? No? Tavo, have you ever heard about uh, Ricardo Semler? Uh, he is uh, the, the owner of Semco Industries. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And um, so that, that was the first time for me when I, when I heard about uh, how, to, uh, how we as the leaders should uh, prefer outcomes uh, than results and, and people can have a flexible, uh, flexible working hours. And these days when we work uh, remotely, this is even more important because I can imagine when my kids uh, have a homeschooling, they need some help, they need some support. And I, I, I can work uh, much faster in the evening and I can, I can manage my work in two hours and that can work in any other company, right? Absolutely. And, and I think that Semco is a great example of, I mean, basically uh, he revolutionized, you no know, Ricardo, like a, a company, manufacturing company in one island in Brazil. So in remotely wasn't, I mean, we're not talking about one of the most renowned companies. And it all started like realizing that it's important to, uh, have people participate, no? Usually culture is co-created by everyone. So it's not what a CEO or the a head of HR do, is how employees want to build that workplace. So it's not just about asking people what they want, but actually it's giving them the power, no? One thing that he did in Semco is they have a cafeteria like in most factories, and in Brazil, the national, one of the national staples, you know, the dishes is feijoada. It's made out of beans and people were complaining because some things that the beans were really well done, some were a little bit harsh. So no one agreed on the doneness point of the beans. So they decided to create a small committee of employees and give them complete freedom to first understand how people really want the feijoada to be, what's the right doneness, and then to work with the kitchen to make sure they deliver. And once that was resolved, people were happy. Not only, but of course, no one agreed with the end solution, but people felt, well, I had a vote, I had a saying, and it's an employee-based solution or employee-centered solution. Once again, employee first. Then they came up with the uniforms. So should people wear uniforms or not? The employee said, yes. So which color? So they started giving employees a lot of decisions that they design on their own without the CEO having a, not even being involved at all. He just wrote the check at the end, as a metaphor. And I think that's critical. No? You asked about what is culture, and when we talk about being people first or culture first, it's about making sure that we understand that a successful culture should be co-designed and should also be created by people, not just a few people at the top. Mm-hmm. I definitely agree. And I also like uh, the uh, screen you, you shared and you presented that... Uh, it has to be about, uh, because I remember uh, me being CEO and, and listening to employees and, and doing what they want. But at the same time, the other side was that uh, there must be some policy, some rules, some norms uh, that we all agreed to, to respect. And I have one, one question, because I can imagine that there are companies on a, on a different stage uh, of how developed is their company culture. Uh, can you use uh, those uh, that culture design canvas for maybe mapping the existing culture or designing a new culture or maybe upgrading the culture? All of the above. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's one thing. I mean, I, besides doing consulting with the with the clients, we also offer a training. So we have a master class that basically focuses on people that want to learn how to use the culture map to use it with your teams to map culture and diagnose culture. Now, one of the things that we teach people is it's not about capturing all the elements and put it on a on a piece of paper or a mural and online and say, oh, great, this is my culture. Well, the point is, what are you going to do about it? So there's a process about 
assessing each of those 10 blocks, you know, purpose, values, the behaviors we reward and punish, feedback, uh, norms and rules, et cetera, and see which one are okay, which ones can be improved, which one are not so okay, and which one are like a in bad, bad shape and we need to do something about it. No? So that's part of assessing the culture. And then we have another, in another program, we also go deep and we have different tools to help companies how to design your team purpose or your company purpose. We have tools to uh, review your meetings and how to optimize which meetings you should let go or kill, which meetings you can simplify, which meetings you can optimize, no different kind of stuff or different tools to help you create a culture of feedback and design team rituals. No? So the, the canvas is like, well, is, like the, is like the Google map, but then as in Google map, you can zoom in and then we have a, a, a lot of tools. I don't want to bore you now, but you know, there are, that help design each of those uh, uh, quadrants or building blocks as we call them. So basically, yes, the tool helps to map where are we today, what's working, what's not working and start designing the future. But in that part, you don't change all the elements of the culture once you start tackling one at a time. You know? So you, you're not gonna change your purpose, uh, your rules and how you give feedback all at once. You need to be mindful about how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then I have one very interesting question uh, because sometimes I'm, I'm coaching uh, leaders of uh, multinational uh, companies and they have uh, subcultures. Uh, how you deal with that? That's awesome. I think that uh, people confuse the world, the word subculture with silos, no? Mm -hmm. And silos are subcultures, but not all subcultures are silos. Mm -hmm. The moment you get, I mean, I'm not playing with words, I'm gonna explain, but the moment you get this concept, things are much simpler, no? So when we talk about silos, we're talking about people that don't want to work with others or they are protective or they hide information because they are not doing the right thing or they think that by being uh, protective and hiding stuff, they're gonna be, no, they're never gonna lose their job. No, it happens a lot in IT. You know, people have a lot of controls and stuff that no one knows. So they say, well, we can never let go of the IT guy because everything is gonna collapse. So he has everything like it. In the case of subcultures exist in every sense of the word and they should exist and we need to leverage that. People feel more connected to the small team that they work. They feel more connected to their projects and the people that they see every day, see in, like this, you know? and they work with every day than with the CEO or the chief operating officer that probably they see once or twice a year if they get to see them. No? So that's a reality of human nature and we're not gonna be able to change. My point is how can we leverage that? So we need to find a balance. When it comes to the core of the culture, remember the purpose, the values, we want everyone to be aligned because you cannot have a, you no, know, be going to work to achieve something different. Everyone, I mean, if you work at Tesla, everyone wants to create, a, accelerate the, a, a, the, the implementation of a new technology you know, that's, that's healthier for the environment. Well, everyone's onto that. But then when it comes to your team purpose, you can have your own purpose as a team. It, and it, that purpose needs to be connected to how my team is gonna serve the company purpose. No? So they need to be connected. Then when it comes to rituals, maybe decision making, so how they facilitate meetings, you need to give them room to have their own peculiarities. And actually the overall company, the top company culture can feed off what different teams are doing and experimenting. So it's a two way kind of street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that idea. That sounds that sounds really really interesting, and uh, I see it in some companies, and some companies can get inspiration from what you are talking about. Good. Yeah. So, Gustavo, before we wrap up, can you maybe share some good resources that people can follow, or do you have your own master classes or or video presentations? Yeah, sure. I think that, uh, I mean, people can visit our website, which is uh, www.fearlessculture.design. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, uh, if they look into resources, which is one of the key sections, you can find lots of tools and stuff that we have. Uh, if you go to the services area in your website, you can find that, as I mentioned, if someone's looking for consulting, look, I need someone like you to give us some basic uh, uh, guidance on how to map or design our culture or coaching to our team leaders so they can run the process, that's okay. And as I mentioned, we also run a lot of trainings. So some people say, well, look, 
we are sending the CEO or someone from leadership development or HR to learn how to master the tool so that they can apply it uh, with their own organization. One thing that's important, we also uh, have consultants and coaches that attend our uh, open workshops, the masterclass and the culture design, uh, the fearless culture program, because they want to use the tools with their clients and that's okay. You know? Because as I mentioned, this is an open source tool. The idea is that the more people that are using it, the better for, for the tool and for the world. Mm -hmm. you know? So we know that we want to build more fearless cultures and we cannot do it just with our own team. So we want everyone to be equipped with it. You know? So in the past, I used our toolkits only to, with our clients. In, in the past year or so, we open up and we're doing lots of uh, workshops online to coach people both within organizations or within consultants to be able to use all the tools that we have. There are plenty, not just the campus, but all the ones that go within each of those uh, quadrants. Very good, very good. Do you, have some, do you have some favorite book about company culture and how to nurture it? Ah, uh, that's a great one. Uh, I always try when they say favorite because I have a lot of... Uh, <laughs> books that I love. So I, I'm looking at my bookshelf for now and see which one comes to life. I think that Creativity Inc., which is the story about how Pixar developed their, their, their culture is amazing. I mean, it's not a, a theory-driven book. It's more about the experience of the journey. Of course, like every business book, it's not the real, but it's the best. It's a story about the, the real stuff and that's okay. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a lot of inspiration about how to build a culture of creative collaboration. No. What so, was the name? Creativity Inc. Creativity Inc. Ah. by Ed Catmull, which is the 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 co-founder of uh, Pixar. So you see, it's all the story of how they build like, create culture there. Right. Uh, then the the culture code. I cannot remember uh, remember the the author because there are two culture code books. One talks about the culture in a sense of uh, an anthropologist that talks about um, his origin from France moving to the US and different cultures. But then there's another, which I cannot remember, that talks about culture, code applied to teams, which is really good. Very, basically simple and inspirational. Yeah. Maybe I can also recommend, this is what I'm reading right now, uh, Reinventing Organizations from Frederick Lalu. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice one. Okay, Gustavo. So thank you so much for spending time with me today. Yeah, I think it was very useful. And if uh, any of you out there have uh, questions for me or Gustavo, let us know in the comments. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, everyone, for, for attending and, and, and staying until the end. And most importantly, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We're always looking for helping people across the world. So thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.